Hello and welcome to another episode of the Process and Automation podcast. From working with our customers over the last couple of years on robotic process automation projects, Arno and I have identified nine steps which lead to RPA success. In today's episode, we will share our learnings on getting started with robotic process automation. So yeah, hello everyone, um, and welcome to, to the episode. Um, so yeah, Anu and I am here um, to, to go through the nine steps of uh, RPA success. And um, yeah, we we, uh, we like to go through through them one by one. And uh, at the end of the, um, the whole episode, you have a good understanding uh, what is important. And uh, yeah, Anu, so the first one I have here on the list is, um, is define your objectives. Um, I think this is a, this is a good good important one to start with. Yes, that's right, Sasha. I think if you look at industrial automation um, in the past and the repetitive nature of what industrial automation did and still doing today, um, we can also apply those techniques to repetitive workflows within inside a business, um, and we can enhance those workflows by using smarter automation, um, by deploying robotic process automation, which is really just software bots that uh, actions tasks very quickly and in repetitive fashion. Now, planning is essential um, before we start our RPA initiative and these nine steps we're going to present today. We, we need to define clear-cut goals um, and stages for our RPA initiative. And, you know, we need to ch chart a course. We need to have specific milestones. And hopefully by following these easy to follow nine steps today, that would lead to your RPA success or starting your RPA journey. And also you need, need to understand where, where RPA fits into your digital transformation goals and a digital transformation journey, because of course that's just one part of it. So Sasha, as you said, you know, define your objectives. Yeah, thank you, Arno. Yeah, was 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 every project as you mentioned earlier. It's very important to to really know where the journey really goes to. Um, it is very important to define your objectives and um, your outcomes uh, for for the project and for as well for for the whole business. So when you hear about these interesting technologies, um, you you have to think about what do you want to get out of it so i think that's 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 the key bit and uh, similar similar um way how you define um, what you want to get out of a new house you want to build so it's so very similar you have to think about um uh, starting with new technologies like rpa uh, robotic process automation so uh, think about um what you can achieve and want to achieve with it and um, what productivity measures you have already in place and how can you maybe exceed them what is important to you and um, as well along the line um, how can you actually uh, improve your staff experience uh, your customer experience as an overall uh, goal potentially so yeah um, defining objectives like was anything in life really and um, in business is, is is the first point and then I would say the second point in the nine step process, step two is finding opportunities. So you've set your definitive objectives. And again, let's say you are looking to introduce scalability in your business. That's a tangible objective. Once you've got those objectives in mind, you need to go out and, and find these objectives or these opportunities rather using that objection or that lens of objectivity. Um, and things to look out for is processes that's got very high volumes of data. So you could easily look at that and say, well, we've got these finance processes. Um, there's a clear opportunity here because we're seeing a lot of churning of data. That might be a, a good opportunity for automation. Also, what we're looking out for is uh, processes that's got a recurring frequency, things that happens a lot repetitively. Like I said earlier in the industrial automation, it's stuff that repeats predictably. 
Um, so that that's the same for for for, the, for these processes that recur frequently. It's the things you need to look out for, these repetitive processes, and then also processes that requires a high degree of accuracy where human error um, is out of the question. Um, you know, again, with financial data, it's very important that those those types of um, processes produce very high degrees of accuracy. Yeah, I think um, all these um, this, um, processes we then have identified, um, we now need to we need to check um, was was um, with experts in the business and with experts in the RPA and process field, um, what is the potential of of these processes we have identified? So if we if we come up with a list of, um, like like Arno you just mentioned, um, we then should look at each of these processes in detail and um, and really see are they actually feasible to implement? Uh, is is it complicated? Is it complex? Um, are they actually um, um, more important than others? And um, so, yeah, this this requires a lot of knowledge. Um, you need to get around the table and to discuss and um, bring company um, um, groups in, from, um, members of, of the team to discuss potential. And um, yeah, and then you have a, a better understanding of what is really the process or what these are uh, these processes to to implement yeah i think with the opportunity opportunity validation um you know the key there is to find the best choices mm. uh, for for the the, the the processes or the opportunities that you have identified um, i think a key driver is also to look at the business value versus the feasibility of mm. implementation um it might have a huge business value but if it's impossible or very complicated to implement and um, that sort of fails your opportunity validation um, and again remember this is to start rpa as you progress and mature your rpa initiative you might go after things that is quite hard to implement because you've already implemented you know all of all of this 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 low-hanging fruit you know you've you've picked all of that so you see you're kind of progressing up into uh, automating some of the, the trickier things and uh, Sasha like you said you know um, you need to bring together your your RPA experts and your process experts to 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 really review these opportunities and also the details of the implementation because that kind of brings you back to the, the feasibility mm. and in my view you know, this this is your opportunity then to define some some success criteria um, in a process you know we don't want any errors in this process. We want to save X amount of hours per day. Um, we want to reduce operating costs. Um, and I think once, you, once you've got that, you know, you're in a good position then to establish governance, to say, well, you know, we have got um, a clear objective, business objective. We have found these opportunities. Um, we've validated them. If we were to implement these, what type of governance do we need to put in place? And this is really where we bring uh, IT and the business together. Uh, because if, if RPA is part of your IT strategy, it's really important to, to align it with, with the broader business um, and their objectives and the initiatives um, that, that they want to um, you know, do with inside the business. Um, so it's really key for from a, a governance perspective to uh, incorporate IT because ultimately, you know, they're going to be the people that provide you with RPA training. Um, they're going to grant you access to, to systems that RPA robots needs uh, to source data from. Um, so it's, it's key to, to ensure that they're on board with the initiative. Um, of course, if your business is really large, um, RPA can be really strategic. Um, so it's recommended that the, the, the RPA has got oversight of your project management office, for example, so that they know, you know, what is in the pipeline, you know, for RPA. Yeah, that's 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 a that's a dream, uh, IT and um, uh, and the business uh, aligning very well enough. But uh, yeah, one thing I thought as well, um, so having this uh, shadow ID uh, IT creeping up um, is 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 quite 
quite important. So, so we don't want um, just because someone wants to avoid IT, um, but we don't want to have system uh, we suddenly need to support we we didn't know about. So this this is this is the horror scenario, um, especially when when those of of these RPA experiments became uh, quite important for the department. Um, so yeah, it's very very important to to get that right. Um, so yeah, that brings us to develop a plan. So since uh, since RPA um, will have an impact on the organization, especially if it's a large organization, it makes sense to to plan um, an implementation uh, very very carefully. So you need to you need to anticipate and. Um, uh, plan for for all areas um, RPA might have an impact to, so uh, it might be that it includes uh, employees suddenly uh, have different job responsibilities um, because RPA is taking over some of that that work they are currently doing, so it might need a bit of retraining so other employees uh, can can then do some other valuable um, stuff in the business, so. Um, so a part of the technical side, so, so you need to have a good plan in your organization to, um, to roll out um, and successfully roll out um, uh, long term. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that all needs to be put in uh, typical document structures, uh, formal documents, so that everyone can, can review it and discuss it and uh, there won't be any surprises um, to whole departments or divisions of, of a larger uh, organization or even in the small small companies the same um so yeah so that's uh, that's very crucial to plan that um with everyone who is involved um, um it's a, yeah it's a very important part to make rpa a success yeah, and i think the planning is it's it's really planning for change to roles and responsibilities of people um so you might have a person that has got pre-RPA specific roles and responsibility, post-RPA, that's going to change. They might be redeployed to something else. So, so you need to um, evaluate those impacts to, to the employees and their roles and responsibilities. And then also from a business perspective, plan how you're going to address that and the expected changes to, to the roles. And you need to understand the impacts of these changes to to people's roles and responsibilities to their day job, uh, and and that's that's really important. And um, you know, a solid plan is 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 really key to the success, um, because operationally people are set in their ways, and the way of working pre RPA is going to be different to the way of working post RPA. Um, so it's 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 really important to have a, a very clear plan. And to articulate in that plan, you know, how you're going to deal with those, those specific changes of, of redeployment of staff. And I think, you know, once you've mm. covered these five steps, um, again, just to, to reiterate, you know, we've defined our objectives of RPA. We found good opportunities. We have now validated the opportunities. We've brought IT into the picture so that, um, you know, they part of those conversations for, for governance. And we've got a good change plan with inside the business to how the roles and responsibilities will evolve. And the next step will really be to spin up a trial or proof of concept. So let's pick one of the um, actual opportunities that you found. And, you know, let's build out a, a, a proof of concept that, that shows, um, you know, the feasibility of your plan um, and you do this before you do large scale rollout because that's important. You you evaluate your your proof of concept um, and all of the, the 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 sort of elements of the previous steps. Um, and our recommendation is you do that really in a in a controlled environment, um, a test environment where operational um, or, or, or business operations are unaf unaffected. So business can continue as usual. We've got a, a pilot or proof concept running um, side by side. And, you know, the recommendation is that you do that for a period of time before your RPA system actually gets 
deployed um, you know, into a production environment. And I think this is also a very um, key moment where you can look at your trial or your proof of concept and you can look at, well, you know, has this actually met our success criteria? So, for example, if your success criteria was to reduce operating costs or to improve customer experience, uh, then you need to measure that. You know, is this actually doing what it was supposed to to, to do? Um, and you shouldn't be scared to to at this stage to rework if if you need to, uh, or to change direction and try a different pilot. So I think that that's that's quite key. And I think at this stage for your first RPA project, um, vendor selection will also come into play where you might look at, you know, all of your objective, the types of projects you're going to do, uh, IT governance, um, you know, your, your business change planning, the outcome of the trial. Um, and you might decide, I, you know, feel like, UI path is a good a good candidate here because it's got automation hub in it. I you might think, well, we want to do Blue Prism because of uh, the ease of deployment or automation anywhere or nice or any any of the the, the, the sort of the vendors out there that that really compatible um, you know with you meeting your objectives. And you know I think mm-hmm. Sasha you will agree that that that's part of the remit of, of what we do is, is to try and shape that for companies and try and make that decision making for vendor selection really easy, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I have I have one question which came came up um, uh, just now. Uh, how how do you think or what do you think is the best time frame to run a trial? Uh, for how long should we should keep it running for? Yeah, it is a good question. Um, we've just came out of a successful trial um, that we ran for a period of three months. And um, and when I say three months, it was three months from, you know, first setting objectives to actually pilot deployment. So mm-hmm. the development was really just at the tail end of that. Um, and we, we, we think that, that, that tends to be for a, 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 a medium to large size organization, um, perhaps not enterprise, a, a, a sort of a, a good period of time mm-hmm. to, you know, to address, um, or to, to go through all of these, these steps. Um, yeah. Yeah, otherwise it, uh, yeah, people start to lose interest again, isn't it? So that's, uh, that's what, what we see a lot. Yeah. So if it's taking too long, um, people forget about it even. <laughs> yes, that's right. But I, I think, you know, um, each organization is different. Um, you know, some people might decide to to run uh, multiple pilots simultaneously, mm. um, which is not unheard of. Mm. Um, I think it is just a function of the appetite of, management to introduce automation with inside their business and then buy in from end users as to you know what the type of, what it, what is the type of impacts they'll see to their roles and responsibility i think mm-hmm. some employee some employees are on board with it because in this particular trial that we've uh, deployed um you know it saves one person three hours a day which is quite significant yeah, it is, yeah. uh, and it's three hours a day of mundane work. I'm not talking about three hours a day of work they enjoy. It's really something they don't really like. Um, and, and you know, so, so there's a high degree of uh, end user uh, satisfaction there because um, you know we're giving them time back. And um, and you know, there's, there's, there tends to be to come back to your question: How long do you need to run the trial? Well, I think that you would you would soon find out if the trial is successful or not by by looking at the feedback from from these people that mm-hmm. you are making impacts um, to, to you know to their their day to day roles and respons- roles and responsibility within inside the business, right? Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. 
So that brings us to to deploy a solution as, as our next step. So once the trial has been successful um, and all the experiments has been successful, even if it has been a series of trials, um, yeah, so the next step can actually uh, start. So this is usually where people get really excited uh, because they can envisage um, the great results from the trial uh, already in production. And um, uh, yeah, and it is obviously fantastic if, uh, if you can save three hours, for example, per day. Um, and if you if you see this happening already um, 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 in production, then uh, yeah, everyone gets really really excited. So, but but there's still something to do to deploy to deploy a solution. Um, we we shouldn't forget about uh, the typical steps we usually um, run through uh, when we deploy a solution. It's um, so still we need to do technical documents and business documents and um, so all these things to to really build and code and into a full solution so so that 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 all needs to take place uh, even in our uh, rpa world and um, yeah so we, we can then uh, think about those steps in detail um, and put this all into action uh, give full speed on the development Put this all into um, into into production systems. Get our people trained. Very important, so that no one no one is surprised uh, when things happen on go live date. Um, so yeah, there's there's plenty of stuff to do. Um, but uh, yeah, it's similar like we have done before uh, when we plan uh, properly. Um, this this whole transition will will be a smooth one, and, uh, and then we can. We get really excited about the results. Yeah, and I think it's just in a question of rinse and repeat. Um, mm. Because once you've deployed your solution, the pilot solution, um, when it's successful, there will be adoption. Because if you're starting to save people's time, um, it's highly unlikely that they're going to want you to turn that solution off, that time-saving solution. So there will be a degree of taking your pilot and productionizing it and strengthening it and, and perhaps, um, you know, looking at enhancing it um, and really just tracking its progress and, you know, looking again at, at the success metrics that you've defined um, in your planning phase, um, you know, your KPIs, for example, that you want uh, the solution to to adhere to and um, you know to, to judge the success um, and you know again examples of, of, of success metrics is um, you know did it provide us that higher accuracy um, did it save us the time it was supposed mm -hmm. to save us um, you know did it improve productivity are we seeing more things happening now with inside the department that this was uh, deployed to, um, you know, did it provide that better end user or customer experience that we were after? Um, mm -hmm. So these are all kind of success metrics that, um, you know, when when you deploy the solution that that you can measure. Um, and I think you should always ask yourself, you know, if if you didn't reach these uh, these goals, um, you know, you ask yourself, well, why didn't we reach the goal? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like I said in, in a previous discussion, um, you know, different people might have different views on what su success criteria is. So management success criteria might be, um, well, this, this need to have a cost saving of a certain amount. It might not reach that. But if you speak to end users, they like, this is great. This saves me two hours a day or even one hour a day. For me, this is a big success. Um, so, so it can be sometimes a bit sub subjective if you look at success mm -hmm. criteria, but failure, you, you know, is is something that um, you need to be able to uh, to to deal with and learn from your mistakes, learn you know lessons learned and all of that. That is quite kind of cliche-ish, but it, it is still true in in this sort of um, in these sort of projects, uh, and you need to challenge yourself on on these sort of things and. You know, I guess that kind of brings us into the next step, the, the sort of improvements. 
Yeah, yeah, indeed. So, yeah, RPA is is definitely a journey. Um, it never never finishes with this one uh, with this one uh, implementation. Um, yeah, always reflecting on how it's working, um, and um, if we if we see in, in some areas of the business new opportunities come up, uh, we we obviously take um, take RPA into consideration uh, again, and um, and then see what what that might bring in that area um so yeah, we will always continue to look out for opportunities and um at existing processes we always continue to improve so this this is very important that we keep that going uh, it's very very normal in business process management in general to to always um, analyze and um, to improve and then again get get uh, into action and um, this this also applies here a lot so um, it is very iterative and um, yeah so uh, the constant feedback from from staff and uh, customers is also very important which leads us then to 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 new projects um, and then the whole circle then we start with step one again and uh, um, hopefully we can produce more and more of those successful uh, implementations yeah so i guess in summary so if we look at those nine steps again just briefly before we wrap this up and perhaps move forward to providing some examples of a, of a typical project um, so again the first step is to define those objectives let's just say cost savings is a good example the second step you know find those opportunities look at those highly repetitive processes look at those processes recurring um, uh, frequently um, document those opportunities and then validate it, you know, do analysis on it, feasibility analysis, um, bring those RPA experts and the, the business experts together so that they can discuss the details of the implementation with the view to choose a successful uh, first pilot. Um, the next step, the fourth step is look at your IT governance, bring in the people from IT, make sure they're on board because they the people that ultimately needs to support this, provide training. Um, business change planning, step number five, very important. You're going to bring something into the business that potentially pre-RPA um, will change the roles and responsibilities of, of people, of staff. Um, you need to plan for that, have a positive uh, a sort of uh, um, mindset to that you're going to give people time back you're going to give them time back to do better things in the business mm -hmm. and then run your trial you know run that trial make sure it's in a controlled test environment um, ensure that you um, run that for a period of time uh, validate the success before you push that into production which is the, the seventh step deploy that now and then really rinse and repeat what you've done um in the in the preceding steps choose another uh opportunity you know push that through you might not decide to trial it because you've got enough experience now to know what to look out for to push mm. that into production and then i guess the last two steps is track the process of these rpa projects are they actually realizing your initial objectives of higher um, accuracy, better user experience, scalability. And then the last step is really just that closing that loop to make further improvements, right? Um, mm. Like we said earlier, it, this thing's not on autopilot. It's something that you might look at and say, you know, we save three hours a day. How can we save four hours a day? You know, how can we, how can we make that better? And so it's a constant sort of cycle of improvement, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one one thing I um, usually um, I like to mention when it comes to RPA is also um, starting starting small. I think that's that's uh, that's important um, to so the opportunities are great. Um, oh, there are lots of opportunities out there, um, but um, just taking the biggest the biggest challenge straight away sometimes uh, um, or. Uh, 
leads to, to leads to failure. So so very often um, we we advise to start uh, quite small. So you have this bigger picture in mind. Uh, that's absolutely fine. So you have the big goals, but especially in the beginning when you embark on that journey, then um, uh, take take one department at a time, less complex maybe in the beginning, uh, and then um, do these iterations, do these nine steps. Uh, and then, yeah, then take the next big project, two departments, two divisions, uh, lots of integrations, uh, lots of stakeholders to manage. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, go from there.